Greetings in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our meditation for today is taken from the Epistle to the Philippians, chapter 4, verses 10 to 13. And it is entitled, Be Satisfied in the Lord. Be Satisfied in the Lord. Apostle Paul was in dire state of need when he wrote the Epistle to the Philippians. He was in prison and was deprived of many earthly joys, the prisons during the biblical times were miserable. The prison which was the traditional site where Paul was imprisoned has two large rooms on different levels with iron shackles fixed to the walls. The lower chamber was a dungeon. The Roman historian Sallust, who lived during the Roman Empire, wrote that the dungeon is sank from 12 feet underground, walls secure it in every side, and over it is a vaulted roof connected with stone arches. But its appearance is disgusting and horrible because of the filth, darkness, and stench. Lighting also was poor, primarily coming from torches or oil lamps. Even the prison guards, who were usually soldiers, were not friendly to the prisoners. Being a prison guard was not an appealing job and was often given to the poorest soldiers. Most of the guards were, in fact, cruel. The prisoners, particularly those that are not Romans, were defenseless. Under the Roman law, if a prisoner will escape, the guard was executed. These tended to make the guards cautious about their wards, to say the least. Therefore, it was natural for them to be cruel so that they might be able to defend their life. Do you remember what happened when there was an earthquake and when the Philippian jailer saw that... Uh, the jail was opened, he thought that the prisoners already escaped and he wanted to end his life. It is because of this. Because once prisoners will escape, then his head will surely go off. He will be executed. Prisoners were bounded also using different lengths of chain, probably reflecting the security risk the nature of the accusation, and the attitude of the guards. A short chain could have hold the prisoner continually upright, dependent upon others for everything. They cannot even move. They will just stay in one corner. A longer chain might permit a prisoner to take a step or two from the wall and to sit or to lie down. Some prisoners were placed in stocks where ankles held apart. These persons were forced to sit on the same filthy spot continually where they discharge their human waste. But even if Paul was de deprived of earthly joys and material comfort, yet his language in Philippians chapter 4 verses 10 to 13 is not of dissatisfaction or bitterness or not even complaining. Even in the midst of a miserable condition, Paul was completely satisfied. We can learn from Paul how we can be satisfied Christian in the midst of material poverty and even miserable situation. We will learn from him how we can rejoice whether in prosperity or in poverty. Please turn your Bibles and we shall see in verse 10, that we must learn to rejoice in our need. I shall read to you verse 10, But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last 
your care of me had flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lack opportunity. We must learn to rejoice in our need because our needs give us the opportunity to have Christian fellowship. Paul greatly rejoiced in the Lord because the Christians at Philippi were able to communicate to him. Paul was not concerned about what kind of provision or the amount of the gift which they sent, but Paul was interested with the opportunity to interact with friends. If you will examine this phrasing in verse 10, the words care and careful have the same root word, which means to think, to remember, or even ponder. The Christians at Philippi always remembered their pastor. The brothers and sisters in Christ would like to encourage Paul. They wanted to know the condition of Paul inside prison. But because they do not have access inside the prison, they were not able to see him face to face. And since they could not minister to him physically, they sent their gifts to him. They were not rich, but they made sure that in whatever blessing the Lord had given them, whether big or small, they remembered Paul and set aside a portion for him. They were very happy to sacrifice that they may provide a bit of comfort to Paul. The needs of the Apostle Paul were an opportunity for believers to share their love to their pastor. God moved the hearts of the brethren to provide for his needs. Paul did not communicate his needs to the brethren. He did not write to beg, but the Christians gave willingly. Paul was happily serving in prison, even if he had needs. He was happy and satisfied with whatever God has given him. He did not force the Philippians to care for him, but he, he was happy to accept, to accept the love that the brethren has given him. He was very happy to accept their love. Their gift was a joy, in fact, in the Lord. Perhaps they expected Paul to be joyful because of the gift, but as the word of God clearly reveals in us, his joy was in the Lord. Spiritual relationships brought the most satisfaction. Their love for him brought joy because of Christ's love and his love for the Lord. Thus, it was natural for a material gift to become an occasion of Christian joy. The needs of Apostle Paul made a way for them to have fellowship and bond together, and the relationship between them grew even stronger. What is our response when we are in need? Our need may not always be money. Sometimes we are anxious of tomorrow. Sometimes we are anxious of today. Sometimes even our past is haunting us. The pressures of work will weaken our spiritual life. Sometimes we may not find meaning in our life. There will be a time when we will be spiritually and emotionally down. What is your reaction when you are down? Do you refuse to seek help from your close friends because you do not want to disturb them? Would you just sit in one corner and feel depressed? Rejoice, my brother. Because God would like you to have fellowship with your friends. Take this opportunity to be ministered by other brethren. Every Christian must be on guard to take care of our brethren. When you see a brother struggling in life, when you notice someone that it is not in his usual cheerfulness, that this brother was 
always been happy and encouraging other people. But at this certain day, he is very sad. And he does not even want to talk to people. Then you will know that there is something wrong with him. We must be quick to approach him. Do not take, do not lose this opportunity to strengthen your bond in Christ. Do not worry that you will lose your time or money because perhaps you will treat him for lunch in order to encourage and talk to him. Invest in spiritual things because friendship in Christ is more important. We cannot afford to just think of ourselves. We must be our brother's keeper. Please turn to Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. I shall read to you Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. A man that hath friends must shew himself friendly, and there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. The brother that the Word of God is teaching us is your biological brother. Your friends in Christ, your brethren in Christ, must be closer to your heart than your brother. Especially those who will encourage you when you are down spiritually. Our bond in Christ must be stronger than our biological bond. There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Especially when you are not in good terms with a brother. Yes, he may be a difficult person. Yes, he might have offended you. But do not forget that he is still a Christian. A beloved of God just like you. When you see him in need, do not hesitate to help because it is a God-given opportunity for you to be reconciled. When... A brother is suffering and you are not in good terms with him. Do not just condemn him. And maybe perhaps you will say, it's good for you. We must not do that. In fact, the word of God is telling us that we must help him because it is an opportunity to win him. Perhaps because of this need, your friendship will be restored again. The Bible teaches us that we must overcome evil with good. Therefore, take this opportunity to win the brother back. Another reason why we should learn to rejoice in our need is, when brethren show love and care, we also remember, just like Paul, that God is providing through them. We must rejoice to see when our brethren are sharing their blessings because the Lord is working through them. There is a time gap between the recent and the last gift which Paul received. Paul told them that at last your care of me had flourished again. The Apostle Paul was not bitter when their gift was delayed because perhaps of certain factors, but he was rejoicing and to told them that their gift was not too late. Paul was not frustrated when the gift was delayed because he understood the struggles of the brethren. Paul was touched by their sacrificial love. Paul was aware that they were also struggling with their life because of persecution, the Philippian Christians were not rich, as I have mentioned earlier. And Paul knew that. 
He knew that some of the brethren cannot even have a decent meal. But even if, how poor they were, they tried to allocate a portion of their substance to Paul. Paul rejoiced by saying, at last, at last the Lord prospered my brethren. At last my brethren are growing in faith. At last they have learned to care for one another. Paul did not rejoice because of the money he received, but their giving was a proof that they were bearing fruits. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul wrote to them, Not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. Their giving is a sign of their fruit. Indeed, it is more blessed to give than to receive because it shows your maturity and love to the Lord. God provides through his people. Oh yes, God can directly provide just what he did to Elijah through the raven. That in the midst of famine, God sent food to his servant. God also provided manna directly from heaven to Israel. But God also chooses to use his faithful people so that they might learn to trust and respond to God. If the widow of Sarephath didn't have faith and didn't give her last meal, do you think God will bless them? Perhaps they might have died in famine. But because she followed God, she honored God. Therefore, even if the surrounding of their houses, there was famine, they were spared, and they have abundance of food in their house during this famine. They were spared, and they lived. So when a brother offers his help to you, do not be too proud to reject it. If you genuinely need help, accept it, because it is God's provision for you. When you reject the genuine help extended by a loving brother, you are rejecting God's assistance. When brethren show love and care, we must remember that God is providing through them. We must learn also to be contented in whatever situation the Lord permits. We can see that in verses 11 and 12. Verse 11 and 12 says, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Paul continues in verse 11 that he is not speaking out of his poverty because he trusts God. It is God who put him there for a purpose. Therefore, he is contented. Paul makes it clear that he was not asking for another gift because he has solved his economic problem. Not with new resources, but with a new attitude. He learned to be contented. The word have learned means experiential learning. It is not like classroom instruction, but like learning while practicing. The word connotes in the sight training. The grace of God sustained the apostle wherever he went. Therefore, he was not afraid of any situation because he knows that his God will sustain him. He knows that his God is his provider. Another important word for us to examine in verse 11 is content. It means to be satisfied with the goods allotted to him by God. It can also mean 
to us no more than he is given. Paul was satisfied whatever the Lord gave him. He was free from worries because he knew that God's provision is always sufficient. What is more important to him was God's presence. He rested in the promise of Christ in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Please turn your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Therefore, having food and raiment, let us be there with contented. Being contented is the ability to conquer circumstances and situations rather than be conquered by them. It is the exact opposite of worry and anxiety. My brethren, what satisfies you? Some are satisfied with the modern and up-to-date gadgets. Some are satisfied when they build big and many houses. Some would like to collect luxurious cars. Some are fascinated with designer clothes and shoes. And of course, food is the most common which satisfies us. Yes, these things are necessary to make our life comfortable. But our life must not only be limited and controlled by these earthly things. We have more important things to do as children of God. And one of it is relationship with our fellow brethren. To build up relationships so that not only on earth we will be together because in heaven we will also be there fellowshipping one another. You must build up relationships. If you are willing to build up relationships, those outside of the church, you are foolish to do that. Because what is important is God's people. God's people who are also God's beloved. Paul learned also to be a base and to abound. He did not let circumstances to hinder his spiritual growth. Through adverse circumstances, Paul developed adaptability. In verse 12, Paul presented three contrasts which provided the occasion for learning and explained the nature of contentment. Please look at chapter 12. The first thing is, he knew how to be abased and to abound. Second, he is instructed to be full or be hungry. And third, he knew to abound and to suffer need. The first and the last speak to physical needs in general, while the middle ones, the second ones, which is he instructed to be full or be hungry, refers to food. In these varied experiences, this knowledge is learned by trusting your God to provide for all of your needs. When you trust your God to provide for you, Material things ultimately do not matter. You will see material things as only a means to keep your body and soul together. You will see your relationships with God and brethren as important. Paul's attitude contrasted with the false teachers. The false teachers were preoccupied by their belly. They were preoccupied of food and other earthly matters. But Paul was concerned about spiritual things, spiritual welfare of God's people, even if that would mean sacrifice for him. 
Paul knew how to react when he has none. And when God has given him blessings, it was totally okay for him to experience hunger for the sake of Christ. But if God would provide food for him, he will not hoard all of these things and keep for himself. But he would share it to other believers who were also in need. Following the example of Paul, we must also know how to adapt in God-given situation. We must not complain, we must not murmur, because God knows better than us. And it is for our learning. When we are in need, we must patiently wait for God and not to take matters into our hand. We must not steal or compromise but must patiently wait upon the Lord. We must not take ungodly contracts because we are fearful that our family will go hungry. Wait upon the Lord. When things are not doing well, rest in the situation that your Heavenly Father knows your circumstances, knows your problems. Therefore, examine yourself and pray for deliverance. That must be our reaction. But when God prospers you, learn also to react in the correct way. Blessings and abundance are not given to you so that you may keep it for tomorrow or for the future. The word abound means overflowing. God gives us blessings so that we might share them to our struggling brethren. When the Lord prospers you, learn to extend your help to some brethren because it is a great opportunity for Christian fellowship, which we learned in our first point of this message. We must be good stewards of God's grace. For all the students, when the Lord blesses you with excellent intellectual skills, Do you look out for weak students so that you may be able to share your talents to them? Or you just sit on your throne being the top student of the class and let others look up to you and you can never be rich? You must help all those who are weak in their studies because it may be God's design to save them through your effort. Through, through your free tutorial and willingness to help. After helping them in their studies, why don't you invite them to church? We must learn also to depend on Christ. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That can be found in verse 13. Paul depended on Christ for strength. The expression, through Christ which strengtheneth me, refers to the indwelling provided by Christ. Jesus Christ will send the Holy Spirit to indwell Paul so that he may carry out his duties. Paul could not accomplish all that God wanted him to do without the strength of Christ. It is Christ who will provide. Paul expressed his dependence on the power of the Lord. He knew that where the Lord led him, the Lord will also enable him. He can do all things as long as he is within the will of God. If what you are doing is outside the will of God, the Lord will not be your strength. Many people abuse this verse and say, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Yes, it can be found in the Bible, but what they are doing are all wicked things. Perhaps one student will say, I can do all things. I can have a better and good result than others in order to show his pride. This promise is only effective when you are within God's will. 
We must not use this verse as a promise of power or enablement to cover our sins. But this promise can only be experienced when you are doing the will of God. Paul was very confident of the Lord's strengthening because he was in prison for God's purpose. He was strong when he was weak. He was self-sufficient only when he is dependent on Christ. Although Paul realized the necessity of living in a Christian community, he also knew what it meant to face life's problems alone and still triumph through them. Who is his strength? It was Christ. Christ was his strength. It is more difficult to triumph in the good times than in the bad times. I would like to repeat. It is difficult to triumph in the good times than in the bad times because it is easy for us to trust and call upon God when we are in trouble. We often cry, Lord, please send your help. And if you will deliver me, I will serve you wholly. I will be faithful in going to church. I will be faithful in reading my Bible. But after the Lord sent his help to pull us out from our problems, Christ is now set aside. That is common to you and me. In our problems, we want Christ to be our strength. But when prosperity comes, we neglect Christ. A Christian's victory comes from a conscious dependence on the Lord. One mark of a maturity in Christ is that the mature know how to depend on the Lord in every situation in life, whether in poverty, whether in prosperity. Paul did not say, I cannot do it, for it is pessimism and refusing God to work in your life. When God's work is given to you and you will not engage in it, you are missing the opportunity to be a vessel of blessing. Therefore, Christians cannot say, I cannot do it. Paul also did not say, I can do it. For it is pride and robbing God of his glory. Whenever, by God's grace, we have been given strength to carry out our day-to-day -day duties, do we refuse to thank God? Or we just conveniently sleep because you are tired? Glorify God because it is God who gave you the strength for the day, and it is God who will give you the strength for tomorrow. But Paul said, I can through Christ because it is trusting and reliance to God. I can through Christ. As a conclusion, I will conclude with a story about a businessman and a Christian fisherman. One early morning at around 9 a.m., one businessman decided to walk along the seashore. He saw one man sitting at one corner reading his Bible. He approached the man and asked him what he does for a living. He answered that he was a fisherman. Then the businessman asked, If you are a fisherman, should you not then be catching fishes on the sea? The fisherman stopped reading his Bible and replied to him, Oh, I just caught many fishes, even more than enough to feed my family today. Now I am thanking my God for a good catch by praising his holy name. The businessman replied, There must be a lot of fishes today. I guess it is a good day to catch. The fisherman replied, Yes, it is. Thank God for that. The businessman continued, why don't you catch some more, since there are still more fishes in the sea? 
The fisherman replied, No need, my friend. What will I do then with the extra fishes? Then the businessman was beginning to be annoyed and told him, Well, you can buy a new boat from the sales of your extra fishes. Then he replied, And then? The businessman was agitated by his reply and told him, You could double your income by working very hard and save more money for your family. The fisherman again asked, And then? The businessman was really angry and answered him, Of course, so that when you grow old, you can just sit down and enjoy life. The fisherman replied to him calmly, What do you think I am doing now? Am I not sitting down and enjoying my life with my God? When we are too occupied by the things of this world, we are behaving just like the businessmen. We miss the important things in our life. We are too busy with our work that we conveniently sacrifice our spiritual life. We will choose to work for overtime rather than attending prayer meetings and church activities. We are very busy that we just give the bare minimum to God. We miss the fellowship of the saints. Fathers want to earn money to feed their family, thinking that when they give material things to their children, their duty is fulfilled. A father knows that your child needs your care. Fathers, your child needs spiritual guidance so that they might know how to live their Christian life. We, as Christians, are spiritual people. Therefore, our priorities must also be spiritual. They need Christ more than any material needs. They must learn to be satisfied in the Lord. And who do you expect to teach them this godly doctrines? It is your godly duty. You will not be able to guide them if you yourself is not satisfied. When you are not satisfied, you will miss the childhood of your children. They will grow as children. And if you are just staying with them for a few hours a day, how can you enjoy them? How can you enjoy their fellowship? How are you able to guide them and form their principles in life? Once your children will grow to adulthood, you cannot return them back. Even if you want to teach them, they will not become children again. Especially when they are wayward because you did not do your duty as a father. All you can do is just pray, Oh Lord, be gracious to my children. Please, my brothers and sisters in Christ, do not deprive your children with what they need most. Teach them to be satisfied in the Lord. Our satisfaction is in Christ and not in material things. We shall all pray.